All right, it's the week of April 8th, 2022, and this is the Fight Business Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick OJ, and today we're going to talk about a lot of things, but before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, BetUS.com. BetUS.com is offering our listeners an incredible 125% bonus on their deposit for UFC on ESPN 34, Luke versus Muhammad 2. Use code SureDog and get up to $2,500 in extra money to make fight night even better. At BetUS.com, you can not only bet on each fight, but they have loads of awesome parlay bets to choose from. Bet live during the fights and your winnings are paid within hours. Start the fight at BetUS.com. Use code SHERDOG, that's S-H-E-R-D-O-G. With that in mind, the lineup for today is going to be a little bit of a shorter episode. We're going to talk about crypto.com, bonuses for UFC fighters, as well as just the crypto being in the MMA space, because it's very prevalent in both fans and fighters. We'll, we'll break all that down. We're going to talk about Bellator 277. Where's the marketing? Is that a strategic move? Well, why would you not market more AJ McKee versus Patricio Pitbull too, as well as Nemkov versus Corey Anderson. There's there's a lot of a lot of big fights coming on Bellator. They haven't really marketed. We're going to break that down. Uh, we're going to talk about an update in the UFC antitrust lawsuit case. Minor update that doesn't affect the case necessarily directly, although it does. Well, I'll break all of it down. It's it's not directly involved with the case. It's with another case that will most likely affect Judge Bulware's ruling so we'll talk about that then we're gonna do some quick hits on pfl getting a deal with mola tv uh daniel kina kinahan sorry i'm i always butcher names uh sanctioned by the u.s treasury department we'll talk about that a little bit and then lastly we're going to wrap up the show by talking about good deal bad deal with disney apparently passing on buying the ufc in 2016 was that a good deal for them or a bad deal. We'll talk about that as well. So timestamps at the bottom as always, and let's go ahead and dive right in. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about today is the crypto.com bonuses for UFC fighters, as well as just crypto in the MMA space. Um, On UFC 273, they introduced a new fan voted bonus where top votes get $30,000, uh, second place gets 20,000, third, 10,000, all in crypto through crypto.com. Uh, and it, it's first and foremost, a popularity contest. If you think it's anything but a popularity contest, I hate to break it to you. That's exactly what it is. Way back in the day, the UFC did a similar fans vote for fight of the night bonuses and turned out the same way. I believe GSP versus Josh Koscheck won a bonus. It was a pretty boring fight and they both got an extra I forget how much it was, maybe 50 grand, uh, something in that regard. And it's going to happen again, right? Anytime you have fan voting, it's almost certainly going to be a popularity contest, as shown by the results. Uh, Hamzat Chemaev got 30,000, which, yeah, he had the fight of the night, so he can kind of get that. But then instead of Gilbert Burns getting 20,000, you've got Volk getting 20,000, which he had a fantastic performance, get that. But then 10,000 went to Piotr Jan, which shows his popularity, right? It it was a solid fight, but it wasn't a particularly thrilling performance from Jan, and he didn't win, yet he was voted number three and thus got an extra 10 grand bonus. So again, popularity contest when it comes to the actual crypto.com bonuses. And uh, Robert Joyner, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, at Rob Nashville on Twitter did point out that the this crypto.com bonus for the fighters is for pay-per-view only so 60k a card times 12 cards a year it's a total of 720k for those keeping score at home the breakdown of money received from crypto.com ufc 17.5 million dollars a year ufc fighters 720k so that's very little um as john nash pointed out it's about four percent of the crypto deal and increases fighter revenue share by 0.07%, although it is fungible, so it moves around. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's not a huge bump. And yes, this is, I think, partially a push to like, hey, fighters, here's something for you. But I think more so it's just a marketing tactic for crypto.com, right? You have to go and, and vote for your favorite fighter. It will expose you to crypto.com ads. It will expose you to the website and the space. So if you've been kind of anti-crypto or maybe unsure about crypto, well, you go and you vote for your favorite fighter and then you're seeing these ads and you're seeing a deposit bonus or whatever is 
they're running right now and you say, okay, maybe I go ahead and I, I try this out. Right. It, it's more of a marketing campaign than anything. It's not really designed to really help the fighters out. It's a ploy to get more users signed up for crypto.com and more money for them to hold. Um, but beyond crypto.com bonuses, you've got a lot of crypto in the MMA space, right? You have Marshall Inu, which was uh, Marshall Inu Rogan at one point, but I think due to legal issues, they had to drop the Rogan where they're apparently giving money uh, to two fighters and they're being pushed by a lot of fighters. Chael Sonnen pushes that one hard. Ali Abdelaziz pushes it pretty hard. A couple others. Uh, you've got multiple fighters touting their own crypto or their own NFTs. Um, Ian Heinish is always talking about various crypto. I think I saw Chase Hoop, Hooper talking about crypto the other day and even Jose Aldo talking about crypto and a particular token, if not an NFT for sure. It, it's rampant in the space. And Again, I think it's just part of the target audience for MMA also lines up very well with crypto, right? Um, and and it's hard to say where crypto is going to go. Here's one thing I will say, though. You have a flood of different coins and different crypto assets that have come onto the market, and they all can't be winners, right? Bitcoin is obviously the biggest bump. Um, Ethereum is out there. You have a, a couple of other coins that are doing well, but with all of these other coins coming out, it's they can't all be winners. So it's important to remember that um, because I think a lot of this is, you know, the crypto craze. I think eventually it'll settle down. There will still be some crypto that remains, I, I think crypto is definitely here to stay just by how entrenched it's become in both the cultural ecosphere as well as as well as, well as financial markets. Um, too many banks have explored crypto ETFs. Too, too many investment banks are understanding the power of crypto in terms of an investment vehicle and wanting to get involved. I, I, crypto is definitely here to stay. But which ones will survive, how it will work, you know, during a recession, during other things that happens is, is all still very much unknown, right? Um, at least at this point. So it's going to be interesting to see how it works, but it, it's not that shocking to me anyway, that crypto is, is running rampant in the MMA community and pushed by the MMA community. For one, it's great for fighters in the sense that they seem to be able to get sponsorships with different coins and different um, companies quite easily, right? Uh, with N whether it's NFTs or it's a particular coin, they are they are doing well in terms of getting those sponsorships, and they're getting paid for it. They're almost certainly getting paid in crypto, but in that particular coin, right? But they're still able to just kind of tout it and say, "Look, I'm just going to put it on social media. I'm going to do all this stuff." Um, and that's that sponsorship revenue for them. So that is great for the fighters. Um, but it will be interesting if these coins crash, if you know NFTs really fall to the wayside and lose their value, which we've seen some evidence of that already. It's going to be very interesting to see if fighters are are blamed at all. I don't think they will be because it's so prevalent, but. There could be backlash, especially for some of the more niche coins that are being pushed by MMA fighters. Um, there are a couple, again, that are pushing very niche coins where they're the main voice or mouth of it, and it's causing an issue. Um, I saw some you know, discourse on Twitter uh, talking about whether Marshall Inu was a pump and dump. It could be. Uh, I could easily see it being a pump and dump, which means, again, you get everybody in, you raise the price of a, a bunch, and then you sell high and hope you sell before everyone else does. Um, but we'll see. It, it, crypto is here to stay. It's going to be a part of the MMA sphere going forward, at least for the foreseeable future. It could easily die off and be a fad and be uh, remember NFTs and remember all that stuff back in the day. And then, you know, it's kind of gone to the wayside forever. That could happen. Um, it could also be kind of a 
new thing that just is now part of the sport and stays as part of the sport, only gains more share. I mean, crypto.com bought the Staples Arena and then are now giving the UFC a $17.5 million a year bonus and now giving fighters $720,000 a year across, you know, multiple fighters and depending again on who is voted for, which is going to be the most popular fighter. So some of the undercard guys that need it, right, probably aren't going to get it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it is a, it is something that from a business perspective, promotions should be aware of for a couple of reasons, because again, if you're trying to, if you're a smaller promotion, you're trying to get involved with a niche coin. Uh, if you are a fighter trying to get involved with a niche coin to get extra sponsorship, there's there's a lot of things out there that are, I mean, all of it's pretty much unregulated, but there are a lot of things out there that could, could come back to bite you um, if you are a promotion or a fighter. You need to be careful. That It's a risk. Anytime you're in a deregulated or unregulated market and space it's it's always extra risk for you as the promotion or in this case fighter if you're sponsoring something right um, or if you're being the face and of this sponsorship uh, this has happens a fair amount also in certain parts of third world countries and and the world where you know you kind of have these guarantees that aren't exactly backed by strong financial institutions or they're backed by governments that are known for being unstable. This happens quite a bit, right? And in that regard, the reward is there if it works out, but there's a lot more risk you need to consider. And a bit of a path you have to navigate to avoid getting caught up in trouble if something goes very, very south, right? If there are shady illegal things going on behind the scenes. If someone comes in and steals all the crypto, which we've seen a couple of high profile cases where hackers have taken all of, you know, 600 some million dollars from certain crypto firms you just need to be wary. It just treading in an unregulated market. You've got to have your, your senses heightened. You've got to protect yourself more and try and insulate yourself and mitigate the risks because the risks are always higher. And that's really what crypto is right now. It's starting to get regulated more and more through various governments. But a lot of this stuff, again, is kind of, I mean, purposefully meant to not be regulated by governments. And so while that does have its advantages, it also has drawbacks. Crypto is staying around, though, at least for the next two to three years. I can't see crypto going away. It's it's pretty much ingrained and part of the promotions now. The bigger promotions are doing tokens. They're doing NFTs. PFL did a token. Um, you got UFC Strike, right? $50 per NFT, which is much, much higher than what NBA Top Shot was doing and things of that nature. Um, you've got the sponsorship with Crypto.com. There's there's so much going on that it's, it's hard not to look at all this and think that crypto is staying at least for the next three to five years. We'll see what happens beyond that, but that's what it is. But yeah, crypto.com bonuses are really, again, just popularity contests. Expect more crypto being pushed. Expect the bigger names like crypto.com, the more established firms to continue to get sponsorships um, with various promotions. It, it's going to be here to stay. It's here for a while. All right. The next thing I want to talk about today is Bellator 277 and the marketing or lack thereof regarding the event. Um, Bellator 277 happens this weekend. You've got AJ McKee versus Patricio Pitbull 2, which is a fantastic, fantastic rematch uh, with two of the best featherweights in the world. Um, and yet there is almost no marketing for it, right? Um, you've also got Vadim Nenkov versus Corey Anderson uh, in the light heavyweight Grand Prix finals I mean those are two very big fights for the promotion arguably the two biggest fights for the promotion that they could have this year 
and yet pretty much crickets. He had a press conference Bellator did for 277 and I believe 279 um, a couple days ago, 9,000 views on their official channel. To give you some perspective on how that compares to the UFC, the Volkanovsky Korean Zombie press conference did 1.3 million. 9,000 views is pretty low for a press conference. I mean, it's really low, to be honest. And yeah, there's not a ton of marketing here. There's not a lot of ads, at least on mainstream television or um, via the internet, the pop-up. Even on my end, right? I usually get flooded with MMA ads just because I'm always in the MMA space. So if I go to a particular site, I see, oh, here's PFL, here's UFC. I'm getting some, but a lot fewer than normal regarding Bellator 277. So why? Why is that the case? Well, I think there are probably a couple of reasons. But for one, as I talked about last week, marketing ROI is very, very hard to calculate accurately. It just is. It's one of the hardest things to really, really get a good sense of your marketing dollars are translating exactly into this increase in revenue in this area. And so when we talk about 277, it's it's behind Showtime. It's not a pay-per-view, right? It's not something where at least you can track the buy rate. You can track the views, sure, but most companies care about the actual revenue driving piece. So let's say I put $30,000 in marketing for 277 and it's only on Showtime. Well, okay, I've, I've spent a bunch on these internet ads. I've spent a bunch on these TV spots, all this stuff, 30,000. And then I noticed that compared to other Bellator shows, there's been an increase about maybe five, 10% viewership. Well, great, cool. But can you attribute that to the fact that, again, this is a more stacked card than the other Bellator cards, right? This has two very important fights. Well, it might be that. Maybe it was the marketing, maybe it was that. Okay, let's talk about where you can actually see the revenue trend. Well, we saw a slight uptick in Showtime subscribers. You know, several weeks after we put the ads out there, showed a 2% increase in Showtime subscribers. Okay, well, great. That's extra money. That's that's big. But at the same time, they also premiered a new season of, let's say, I don't know, Dexter or Billions. Well, okay, is is the subscribership up because of Dexter? Is it because of Billions? Is it because of the extra Bellator marketing? It becomes very gray, very murky. And so I think that the fact that it's just behind Showtime, and especially given Showtime's model, and what they're trying to achieve with CBS Viacom. I believe they view Bellator more as just a content commodity now, right? You're going to have people that signed up for it. The hardcore of the hardcores are going to watch it. But for the most part, it is not going to be as easy to translate marketing into shown increases in Bellator viewership. It, it's just going to be harder, at least for this particular card. Um, if you had a consistent budget and you did it across all cards, you could probably find some stronger correlations, but even then you'd have to do some data analysis and data analysis while great can also be manipulated in multiple ways. It gets a little gray again. That's really just what marketing ROI is. So in my opinion, the way and the lack of marketing right now is firstly based on that. It's that, you know, Steven Espinoza is now Scott Coker's boss. He's more of a boxing guy. I think he understands MMA, right? Especially helping to co-promote McGregor versus Mayweather. He, he really gets that space. But at the same time, it's viewed as more of this is just another show on our sports arsenal this is this will you know do some cross promotion as they've talked about with having some showtime boxers on bellator and vice versa um and and it's it's just one of the kind of bullets in in the chamber for showtime so to speak i don't believe he views it as a potential to be a giant 
mega promotion if they put the money and effort behind it. That's my sense. Number two, viewership, right? And this is where we talk about brand. The UFC has created such a such an immense competitive advent, advantage with their branding. I mean, it's clearly the perception is that the best fighters are in the UFC for most people. For the hardcore hardcores, you start going into, you know, media members or people that watch every single kind of fight night. They would disagree depending on the division and all of that. But but even those people in general would say that the UFC has overall as a promotion the most talented fighters, which goes back to our scarcity model that I've talked about on this show, right? They overall, they have the biggest share of the top fighters in the world. And so even though you have AJ McKee and, and Patricio Pitbull who could very easily fit into the UFC's featherweight division with maybe one or both of them competing very well with Volkanovsky, Holloway, those top elite featherweights in the UFC, the perception isn't there. And this was definitely put, you know, into the spotlight, so to speak, when McKee originally won the belt from Pitbull. I mean, the arena was going nuts. It was a crazy performance. It seemed almost McGregor-esque in some instances. I wouldn't say it was that big, but it was, I mean, the biggest thing Bellator's had akin to that type of moment. And yet there was almost no coverage of it outside of the hardcore MMA media, right? You, you had the hardcore guys saying this is a crazy, awesome event. You had a lot of people saying this is amazing, but it, it never gained traction. I didn't hear about AJ McKee on any non MMA site post win, not a single one that, that shows something that shows that. And this was prior to the showtime deal, I believe. Um, I mean, that just shows that there's not enough traction. He's, he's not a, a star in that regard. And I know some people are screaming through the computer screen right now, or, you know, if you're listening on audio saying like, what, what are you talking about? But it is what it is. The numbers don't lie. Right. Um, same with Kayla Harrison, right? Kayla Harrison is viewed as one of the best women's MMA fighters in the sport amongst hardcores. And yet she's not that big of a draw. We haven't seen those numbers translate into PFL broadcasts. Now we don't know what the ESPN plus numbers look like. Sure. But I mean, it's one of those things where she's not a Ronda Rousey. She's not a, you know, Holly Holm, who has translated that into several different sponsorships, more mainstream media attention, all of that. That's just not the case. Same with AJ McKee and Pitbull. Right. And even though you have Corey Anderson, who has beat the UFC light heavyweight champion, Clover Teixeira, as well as, you know, had, I believe, gone one and one with Jan Blahowicz. Um, or, I mean, yeah, it, it's just, there's there's almost no buzz. So I'm guessing they looked at the numbers and, and saw based on engagement, based on these other things, that they're not a huge pull. And then, then the question becomes, if you're Showtime and you're Bellator, is how much marketing do we want to throw at this to see if we can bump those numbers up? And again, that becomes a very quick cost prohibitive realization because you can't directly attribute a lot of the marketing dollars easily. And you could throw a hundred thousand dollars at this thing. There's no telling it will actually make even a dent, right? And that's money, especially now that you're the larger Viacom CBS, that's money that you know, if you're just blowing that money, it's it's not a good look. So I think that's why you see a lack of marketing for Bellator 277. I'm still going to watch it because it should be a great fight. I know some of the hardcores will. Most of you watching the show, I would imagine, are hardcore enough you're going to watch it. But don't expect a big crossover. Don't expect, oh, man, this was amazing. Did you guys see the fight and, and see this in the mainstream media anywhere? 
you're going to see a couple of maybe a couple of MMA writers for bigger sites um, like New York Post or some of those areas maybe touch on it. But even then, I doubt it. I think mostly you're going to see it amongst, you know, the big MMA media sites. And that's going to be it. And it's going to kind of be hush hush beyond that. And that's just something that Bellator and Showtime and Viacom CBS have to decide is how big do they want to push it right now? I'm getting all indications. It's just another round in the chamber of their content. That's it. And, and I don't think that's going to change regardless of how 277 goes. So maybe something else, maybe some other catalyst, a very big signing from the UFC or, you know, I know Coker's talking cross promotion, but that'll never happen. Maybe something else will be the catalyst that gets a, more people interested in Bellator, but it's not going to be this fight, unfortunately. All right. Just want to give another shout out to our sponsors of BetUS.com. UFC on ESPN 34, Luke versus Muhammad 2 is more fun when you bet at BetUS.com. Use code SureDog and get an incredible 125% bonus up to $2,500. Luke is a clear favorite against Muhammad, so get in now or even choose to bet on a win via decision and increase your winnings. At BetUS.com, you can make the fights even more fun by betting throughout the fights. Start the fight at betus.com. Use code SHERDOG. That's S-H-E-R-D-O-G. All right, next thing I want to talk about today is an update in the UFC antitrust lawsuit. So we did get a decision regarding Olin Wholesale Grocery Co-op versus Bumblebee Foods LLC, um, which was essentially the case that Judge Bulware had said he wanted to wait and see what that ruling was because it involved antitrust litigation and um, it, it could have have an effect um, on his decision, right? Because there were there was overlap between the two cases. So since he wanted to wait for that ruling, see what they said, that may or may not influence his decision in terms of how he would rule on the class certification. And this is Keep in mind, just the class certification of the lawsuit. This isn't saying, oh, the lawsuit is, you know, going to trial and that stuff. No, this is just about class certification. If you've missed any of the earlier episodes we've done on the antitrust lawsuit, Kate, uh, make sure to check it out. I've got a couple of articles also at SureDog, um, The Body Lock, plenty of episodes out there to get an idea of what's going on in the antitrust lawsuit case. But with that in mind, this ruling essentially allows bullware to continue on with his decision to certify the class that's what he said verbally i mean it's been forever now i think it's been eight to nine months almost a year since we've heard anything from judge bullware but the last we had heard he had called a meeting to kind of just make sure covid wasn't messing with people too much which was okay and then verbally said he was going to write an order that the class certification would be granted he then put a pause on it and said, hey, there's this other case over here that affects class certification. I want to see how that pans out. And then depending on that ruling, that could affect my ruling whether or not to certify the class. The resolution of this other case, the Wholesale Grocery versus Bumblebee Foods, essentially means that Judge Bulware can move forward with certifying the class and feel confident in the decision, right? Because you now have another case that also kind of allows some breathing room for that type of decision. Because when we're talking about the arguments in the antitrust lawsuit case, remember that these arguments are based on analysis that is relatively new, right? The plaintiffs are using a new type of analysis to show wage discrimination to show the monopoly power of the UFC. It's, it's not your traditional type of analysis that's been used in several antitrust cases before. So if Bulwer is going to certify the class, if he's going to allow this to go forward, it's one of those rulings that could get overturned or could um, end up being kind of a black mark on his record if it is way out there compared to what other courts are doing. Right. Um, and, and yes, you're a sitting judge. So you're usually granted a lifetime appointment, which I believe Bulwer 
is in this case. So it's not like he has to worry about his job, but it, it's about reputation. It's about, you know, all of that stuff. So um, I think this has been Bullware being extra cautious and just waiting. Now that this is out there, there's no reason he can't write certification on the class. Will he do it quickly? Probably not because we've seen him take his time in other regards, but um, there's nothing holding him back now where if he were to grant class certification and then this case had gone the other way, it already conflicts and there's more likelihood that his ruling is overturned. Instead, the resolution of that case has paved the way for him to rule for class certification without that interfering which is why he was waiting. So I don't know when we're going to hear anything more. I don't know when we're going to get the written order or anything of that regard. Um, they'll probably set up an appointment where you can call in. Most of the media, MMA media now has kind of picked up to this, um, where you can kind of be part of that call. Um, if I get that information, I will let you know. Um, and I will, of course, try to be on that call to hear the official written order. Um, although actually at this point, you know what? He's he's already kind of had the call where he's, he's spoken to everybody. So instead expect a filing. I will look for a filing in the system that says, okay, here's the written order for class certification. And then that may allow a cascade effect of other things to happen. Most importantly, it may allow for several documents to finally be unsealed, right? The judge has indicated that there's a bunch of financial documents and a bunch of other things that are sealed right now and asked and you know if there are any objections to him unsealing them because he thought they should be unsealed and made public information he had objections from multiple parties but bullware seemed to kind of dismiss them i mean we'll see if he actually decides to keep those docs under wraps or or whatnot but that's the one where once that written order is made that's where we might get a ton of new info, which would be huge. So I will keep you updated if I hear anything. I know it's been a long time since we've had an antitrust lawsuit update. I apologize that it's probably not the one you're hoping for with some big new shocking information, any of that. No, it's it's at least movement though, or it should be. We'll see, because we're still waiting on the judge to write this order and to certify the class. So the minute I hear anything else, the minute I hear anything else, I will let you know. But yeah, that's... Uh, that's where we're at right now. All right. So next thing we're going to hit today is our quick hit section. If you didn't see last week's episode, this is a new segment I'm doing every week or mostly every week that where we're going to talk about business updates, I think are important, but we don't need to spend a ton of time dissecting and bringing analysis to. So first up, PFL has announced a exclusive multi-year broadcast partnership with Mola TV, which is an over the top uh, streaming service in Jakarta, I believe. So this is from a PFL press release. Um, fastest growing, most innovative sports league. Yes, uh, PFL and Mole have agreed to exclusive multi-year broadcast partnership featuring the inaugural PFL Challenger Series in 2022, along with the regular season, playoffs, and world championship. Spearheaded in partnership with Athletic Sports Group and a subsidiary Fight Globe, Mola will become the exclusive PFL content provider in Italy, Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. So... Again, this is a international media rights deal for PFL. It's it's good because again, it's extra revenue for them. We know the ESPN deal is about ten million or so, um, and then they've got new sponsorships coming in, which was stated at ten million. Um, could be more than that by the end of the season. Now you've got another international rights deal here, which brings in more money to help them get into the black, which is what they're really trying to do, and also to get past some of their betting fiasco as we covered last week um so you have a couple quotes here um from svp uh inter of international james Furwin. um you, you, you know P professional fighters league is proud to announce a multi-year broadcast partner with mola beginning with the 2022 pfl challenger series and through 2023 we're thrilled to excuse me, we're thrilled to continue our global expansion and deliver MMA fans a unique viewing experience with access to an unprecedented season full of events, innovative media products, and consistent coverage of our world-class fighter roster. Um, 
you got a couple quotes here from Mola. You know, MMA is the fastest growing sport in the world. PFL is one of the fastest growing promotions. Yeah, I guess maybe technically that's true. Uh, excited to be able to showcase their events and bring more quality MMA events to our market. So again, this is an international rights deal. It's it's nice, but it's not, you know, we're talking millions upon millions of dollars, at least probably not, but it's a nice added feather in the cap to PFL as they try and, you know, solidify themselves as a top tier promotion and it helps get them into the black. So always a good time. A second thing I want to talk about here, and some of you may be surprised I'm doing this as a quick hit, but uh, to be frank, I don't know this world as much. I'm not into the boxing world as much. Um, there's a lot of websites you can go to that have more in-depth discussion on this, but that is that Daniel uh, Kinahan uh, has been named as part of the Kinahan crime or organized Kinahan organized crime group. And the U S government is offering a $5 million reward for information that leads to the disruption of the KOCG or Kinahan's arrest and conviction. Um, you had Bob Arum and, and Tyson Fury who are associated with Kinahan essentially break ties and say, we're not doing this anymore. Darren Till has been associated with Kinahan. Um, it's a big deal. It's, you know, $5 million reward that leads to their arrest or conviction. Having the U S department, uh, I believe it's the treasury department, um, you know, come out and say, this is a crime group and, uh, we want information to bring these guys down internationally. That's a very, very big deal. Um, it's 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 pretty rough. So don't expect uh, Keenan to be involved in the MMA space, at least on the surface, as much anymore. He had tried to back in 2012, um, kind of paint himself as someone that was legitimate in that area i believe he had discussions with conor mcgregor at some point um or some deals with conor mcgregor um or at least talk about him being around mcgregor again i don't know this space as well as some of the others out there uh i know he was associated with fury where fury actually thanked him after uh one of his heavyweight fights on his comeback and then darren till is known association so he will be you know kind of cut out but yeah it's just oof not a not the greatest uh, people to be associated with and you know it's mma it's I, i'm not super surprised that you know between kinahan and kadirov uh you know not super surprised that this is kind of how it goes so yeah that's another quick hit i wanted to let you know about um yeah and then that wraps up this section if you have any information that you want me to cover in a quick hit or any, you know, minor business thing that you think I missed over the week, let me know. I'm more than happy to bring it up, give you credit. Um, I love talking about this stuff. So if you got any little tidbit of information that relates to business and MMA, hit me know, and I'll put in the quick hit, quick hit section. I also talk more in depth about topics. If you want me to just let me know what those topics are. I'm sorry. I cannot speak today. Rough, rough day already, but yeah. Uh, don't expect, uh, Darren Till or, or Chimaev, in that regard, uh, to be shouting out their buddies, Kinahan and Kadyrov, anytime soon. I just don't think it's going to happen. All right, last thing I want to talk about today is a segment that I am going to be doing at least again semi-regularly, if not regularly, Good Deal, Bad Deal. According to an article at CNBC, in 2016, before the UFC sold for $4 billion to Endeavor, the Mixed Martial Arts League was nearly bought by Disney. Yes, Disney, which, you know, is known for Mickey Mouse and kid-friendly television and all that fun stuff, just about bought the UFC. Um, Ultimately, Bob Eager, the CEO at the time, decided to say no to the deal. Specifically, it sounds like because of brand issues, right? They didn't think that the violence and the blood and all that would fit into the Disney family marketing, which makes sense. But now they are paying... UFC a ridiculous amount in media rights, and that's only going to increase, right? The deal goes through 2026 and could easily end up doubling upon renewal with what Disney would have to pay. So the argument here comes down to this, especially with, you know, ESPN and Disney loving the UFC content and loving the amount of, you know, viewership 
that those events are getting, uh, loving the amount of subscribers it's driven for ESPN plus. Was it a good deal or bad deal for them to pass on the UFC because of, of their image? And, and it's, it's tricky because in some regards, yes, it's pretty clear by the numbers that they're missing out on a large amount of revenue, right? If, if Disney had bought the UFC outright, I mean, they'd be getting all of the perks that Endeavor is getting right now. And it's again, and why Endeavor is afloat and becoming a much larger company and, and driving forward with their growth has all been the UFC. We've talked about that. The UFC is the crown jewel of the organization, but at the same time, I mean, that is a stark contrast to the Disney brand. Uh, it's one thing to, you know, be involved with ESPN and have sports that aren't violent be a huge part of your portfolio. It's another to embrace the violence to a whole new level, as well as some of the carnival-esque type nature and shady characters that hang around in the UFC, right? We just talked about Daniel uh, Kinahan and, and we've talked about Ramazan Kadyrov in regards to, you know, how MMA isn't exactly the most family-friendly sport, especially with, you know, you've got uh, you've you've got Masvidal attacking Covington. You've got several scandals amongst fighters. You know, with domestic abuse or or domestic violence. Um, yeah, it's not it's not the best in terms of a family friendly image. Keep in mind, back when the UFC was trying to, you know, become more of a I don't know how to phrase it. Uh, a more upright organization, you know, a good citizen type organization. Uh, when they introduced their code of conduct back in 2012 or 2013, right? They could have brought that back. My guess is if Disney buys the UFC, they bring that back. Suddenly you're going to have a much bigger visibility on what's going on. Uh, it would have caused a lot of changes, I would imagine especially from the top down, I'm sure Disney would have wanted a lot of changes in the way that the UFC conducts itself as well as just brand brand and image PR type changes, right? You've got to, you can't have something like Covington Masvidal happen. You can't have the same type of just flaunting. Yeah, we've got, a dude here that is super connected with uh, a dictator and that dictator is now Lieutenant General of Russia, right? There would be so many more obstacles and hurdles to jump through such a bigger lens and microscope on the company. Things would have to change. And just like Endeavor changed, you know, the cost structure of the UFC by cutting so many people and trying to get those cost dynamics. I think you would have had, some of that, maybe the same amount with Disney, but you definitely would have had a brand shift. You would have had a marketing and brand shift. You would have had a push to be a more respectable sport. It would have been tough. It would have been a big transformation for the UFC organization. It would have been huge. I'm not sure how Dana and some of the execs there would have reacted, to be honest. Whereas Endeavor bought the company was like, you keep running it the way you are. We're just going to, you know, trim some fat from the budget and we'll figure this out. And it's worked very well. So there's, you know, potential for synergies with the UFC, but, and, and Disney, but not nearly as much as say Endeavor and Disney or someone that's going to, you know, um, you know, let them do their own thing. So that's another factor to consider here. Despite all that, though, I think it was a bad deal for Disney to pass. Just because rather than paying the UFC, again, I think it's $1.5 billion over the course of, you know, this, this next uh, four years or so, I mean, they would have just been able to, 
use their own production crew and they would have saved all that money. And again, it would have just all been in their bank. I mean, you've seen what the UFC can do as a financial powerhouse for a company like Endeavor. Imagine what it could have done for Disney. You would have had a rough transformation. You would have had a certain distancing by Disney, right? They would have definitely put it under the ESPN umbrella and not anywhere near like Disney plus or anything like that. Um, but at the same time, the, the, the numbers don't lie, right? The growth we've seen in the UFC um, had the best year ever last year. That could have all been Disney's. And from a monetary perspective, it's hard to imagine that even with the growing pains and the transformation pains that would have happened by buying the UFC and changing their brand image and all of that almost certainly still would have been just as popular, if not more popular, would have gained a little bit more standing as a respectable sport. I think the UFC's image, if it did shift to being, you know, enforcing the code of conduct, they brought up and created in 2012 and kind of getting more of a, okay, yeah, we can still have this bad blood and all this other stuff, but we're going to be more of a respectable organization. I think that's the real next key to this in terms of growth for the sport. Um, but yeah, instead it just didn't happen. Um, and, and again, it's not a terrible deal. It's not like a, what were you thinking? Because obviously it would have been a, a large uplift to get the UFC to be a family friendly company or at least acceptable levels. Right. Um, so it's not like, Oh, you really messed up by not taking this deal. It's like, no, I can understand it, but th the numbers don't lie here. And if Disney had put in the time and effort to clean up the sport, so to speak in certain ways, I think it would have yielded even greater benefits than it will for endeavor. Right. Because if the UFC cleans up its act, then you're going to have multiple other organizations make sure they clean up their act, too. And I mean, Bellator and PFL and one even uh, one less so because of some of the uh, shady underdealings of PFL obviously just have the fiasco with the betting lines. But they have a certain image of, you know, respect and honor and all these things that they seem more adapt to that change or, or adept to that change, rather. Um, but yeah, if you were able to really transition the UFC into being more respectable, that I think opens the door to a lot of things. So I'm going to say bad deal just because of the revenue and the potential, but it's not a terrible deal like, oh, you messed up and it's the worst thing in the world, right? I mean, you get it. You understand why you don't want a bunch of blood and cursing and uh, you know inappropriate language when you're also trying to sell Mickey Mouse and you know some other stuff. All right, guys. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Five Business Podcast. Thank you so much. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like, subscribe, bell notification button. If you're on uh, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, Spotify, any of that stuff, again, make sure to look through the Sure Dog uh, list of podcasts. It's not on the old link that it was, but really appreciate you guys listening. Any questions, any comments, concerns about anything I brought up, let me know. Um, anything you want me to talk about, again, wide open for fan questions. Love that stuff. So, more than happy to dive in and answer those burning business questions for you. Thanks again. Love you guys. And until next time, get money. Who are you betting on at UFC on ESPN 34, Luke versus Muhammad 2? Can Muhammad beat the odds and defeat Luke? Or is Luke winning by TKO a given? Get your bets on this weekend at betus.com. Use code SureDog and get 125% bonus. Betus.com has been taking bets for well over 25 years, and there's a reason it's the number one UFC sports book. More betting options, live betting at games. BetUS.com is your new home for UFC betting. Start the fight at BetUS.com. Use code SHERDOG. That's S-H-E-R-D-O-G.